welcome. We are shocked, but pleasantly shocked, to see the size of this group. We're going to try and talk quick so you don't get too hot and sweaty in here, but it's pretty comfortable so far. Um, my name is Jeff Joswald. It's my brother Joel and my sister Jan. They're the babies of the family. Um, we, uh, we aren't from Wapaka originally, but we grew up on Morrow Lake for, I think, since 1953. I first came up here with my grandma and my two cousins. In the 1930s, our uncle, Og Vandermeulen, was a teacher and a basketball coach at Wapaka High School. And he ended up somehow knowing the Hildegards. And in 1953, we rented a cottage from them on Morrow Lake, which uh, we enjoyed, I think, four summers in there until 1957, when our other grandparents bought the place we currently have on Morrow Lake, which is right across from the park, the side of the park. So we've been around for a while. Our intent with this was not to make money. Uh, we printed the book. We gave the book to Tracy and Historical Society just to get the cost of our printing covered. And the rest of it is all going to the Historical Society. We've got a few here. Um, if there's interest, uh, let us know, or let Tracy know, and we can get more printed and work out the arrangement with Historical Society. I'm winging it because I somehow lost my notes. <laughs> I think I can handle this here. Um, they might have got passed out with the handout. <laughs> so you probably got to know more than I do. The, uh, the handouts that some of you got, I don't know if everybody got them, because uh, there's a lot more people than, than we expected. But what it is, it's like a two page on both sides. One just is a poem about uh, trees and the other one so is a timeline of what happened at Whispering Park, Whispering Pines Park when it started, what was developed when, and then there's a map that I drew which is not to scale, but it gives you kind of a rough idea of what was where back in the day. Now the other thing I'd like to mention though is this year is the 90th anniversary of Whispering Pines Park. It was in 1929 that Kildegards built their house there and started that whole thing. Now, we look at it as, I look at it as two different eras of the park. There was Whispering Pines Park as it existed prior to 1974, or I should say prior to 1975, and now as it's been since then. How many of you remember it from back in the old days? Oh, good, 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 good. Excellent. How many have seen it in the new days without knowing what it looked like in the old days? Oh, good. So. We don't care about you guys. We're going to talk every day. <laughs> How many? Those are my nieces, and they're not going to hassle us too much. Um, how many worked at Whispering Pines Park? Holy smokes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Dennis, you had your hand up, right? Yes, All right. Good. <laughs> Donald. 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 Well, it depends which copy of the book you read. Yeah. <laughs> and the first edition of the book, we, we hid his identity and called him Donald, but then we decided. Nah, he needs to be named like the rest of us were, so. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's our, our background on Morrow Lake. Our involvement with Whispering Pines started in the 50s. Um, we spent a lot of time there as kids, and especially after our grandparents owned the place that we have now. Somewhere around 1960 or 61, both our grandparents worked there. Um, I, our grandpa did some of the groundskeeping stuff on a part-time basis. Our grandma ran the main souvenir shop from, I don't know, sometime in the 60s up until it closed, pretty much, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so we also worked there. I worked there in 1963 and 64. I was kind of illegal in 63 because I was underage, but we had, nobody cared in those days. Joel worked there in 1968 along with Dennis because he and Dennis worked together in those days. And Jan was kind of the unofficial 10-year-old bouncer at the museum, right? <laughs> 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 so anyway, this, this whole thing here, that, uh, our, our project here came about, um, the three of us decided, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago almost now, I think, that it's such a unique story. And we had, obviously, a major interest in it and some knowledge, not a lot, but some, and a lot of good memories that we wanted to preserve it somehow. Because you go in the park now, as you know, and 
somebody who had never been there before would have no clue of what was in there before, of everything that was in there before. And the fact that the Hildegards came in and put all this stuff out there for the public to use free of charge was incredible at the time. And it served a big niche for a lot of families to do stuff. You know, it was during the Depression, it was during the Second World War that people didn't have the money. It was kind of a bad time that the country was going through. But here you had this park with all these amenities, picnic tables, you could picnic for free, you could go down and feed the fish. You could oh, do all that. Yeah. Penny. Yeah. Penny. 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 <laughs> Not if you brought your own oatmeal. <laughs> anyway. I have to say, again, we're not experts on this. We know a little bit. We knew the Hildegards, um, albeit when I was very, very young, and they were younger. We knew them. We had experiences there. A lot of the stuff that we put in the book was stuff I had from direct discussions with them over the years, or years ago, I should say. People since then, and we got a lot of stuff out of the Wapaka County Post and the Wapaka Picture Post which was a very, very valuable resource for us to get information and photos. <coughs> we have a lot of photos. I've got a photo album back there. It's my master one. It has a lot more photos in it than what we're going to show you here and what's actually in the book. Um, someday I'm going to donate that to the Historic Society too, but for now I'm going to keep it. So there's, there's a lot of pictures out there. Um, this whole presentation I'm going to go through the history of Whispering Pines very briefly. Then we want to talk about our experiences there in the respective years we hung out there and worked there. But more importantly, we want to take a lot of time here, as much as we need, to get input from you folks. Here are your memories, because I want to learn, we want to learn from you probably more than you're going to learn from us. Our whole goal here is to keep the memory going and to recognize what the Hildegards did. Now, if you have any questions, please ask them or comments as you go along. Um, otherwise, we're going to take a break somewhere along the line here, and we'll have time for questions and stuff too. And then we'll also, again, have time for people to share the memories, the thoughts, their experiences as you want when we get there. Okay? I'm supposed to watch the time because I end up getting long winded sometimes. <laughs> Let's do the, um, well, I'll start out with the history. I think we put the time. That is an old picture of the entrance. These color photographs are from the Byers family, who also live on Marl, uh, Marl Lake. Irwin Byers donated these to us a long time ago, and the family has been very interested. They live just, well, they live right next to the park now. There's no house between them. Um, in 19, well, let me back up. In 1887, Chris Hildegard was born in Denmark. And he worked as a farmer. He didn't really complete a lot of schooling before he moved here back in, I think it was 1906. He moved to Chicago. He got a job there washing milk wagons for Borden's milk. By the time he turned, well, I'm sorry. He worked there for quite a while. But then after, I think it was about 1918, he ended up rising up through the ranks. And he, with two partners, started their own milk business called Borgens. Now. Borden's and Borden's were very similar. And there was some competition there, but Hildegard's made a lot of money on that milk business. And he married Emma Hildegard. Emma, Emma Gibson was her maiden name in 1918. She was a secretary in Chicago, and they got married. They lived in Chicago for, I don't know, 11 years after that, until they moved up here well, I should take that back. They, they got the property up here in 1929. That's when they actually started Whispering Pines. And they built their house there. They lived in Chicago, but summered up here until 1938, when they moved up here full time. <coughs> now, <coughs> they did it, I think it was by design, but it was probably a little bit of luck involved, too. They sold out their milk business for a lot of money. This was just before the Depression. So they had a lot of money. But what they did is they invested it all in their property over the years. They, they put everything they had into that, their heart, their blood, their soul, their money, everything. Um, they loved it up there, up here, I should say. So they, um, let's see if I remember this now without my notes. They, they started out in 1929. 
the first thing they did is they built a rock garden facing the lake. Then they started adding flower beds, because Emma loved flowers and she was really good with them. So they started adding flower beds. And before too long, they started adding uh, statues, statuettes, lawn ornaments, things like that. This thing all evolved over a number of years to what it kind of peaked out at in the 70s, which was huge. Uh, there are two souvenir shops, a refreshment stand, a big museum, a major playground, a nice developed waterfront, and things like that. At one point, I think when you guys worked there, there was a campground over on the Teddy Wawa side. Um, but it, it took a while for that to all evolve. The way it evolved, though, is they opened it up as their front yard to the public because it was so beautiful. They were so impressed with the trees, the animals, and everything there, they wanted everybody to be able to enjoy it. So people came out and they, by word of mouth, <coughs> they started coming. Then they started talking about, well, it'd be nice if we could bring a picnic and have a place to have a picnic. So they put in picnic tables. From there, it went, well, this is all nice, but it'd be nice to have something to take with us to remember this place. So a souvenir shop went up. <laughs> then, oh, it'd be nice if we didn't have to bring our lunch, if we could buy a hamburger or a cup of coffee or ice cream, <laughs> put in a refreshment stand. And that's how this whole thing evolved. It's what the people wanted, what the people asked for, and they delivered. So that's how it kind of all evolved. Now, I'm going to have to get my specs on here to run through this. This is in your handout. Um, this talks about some of the stuff I already talked about. In 1932, the one thing that's left there, there's two <laughs> things left there from the original part. One is the stone stairway <coughs> going down to the lake. That was built in 1932 by Chris and Casey Nowicki. Casey Nowicki was a World War I vet who came to work for Chris back in 1920 <coughs> on his milk business. They became very good friends. In the end, Casey retired and moved up here, and he was the caretaker at the park up until its closing in 1975. But anyway, Casey built that stone walkway with Chris, and he always would say, they built it in about three weeks, and he lost 15 pounds in the process. <laughs> <laughs> that was a diet I don't think I'd want to do. But, but anyway, that's one thing that's standing. The other thing that's standing is the concrete foundation for the refreshment hut, which is as you first come in there, and they intentionally kept that in there to put a picnic table on it so it could be wheelchair accessible for people. I don't know how much that's used, to tell you the truth, but that's all that's left, and we're going to get into the, the change in a little bit. <laughs> anyway, picnic grounds were opened in the summer of 35. Already, by 1936, they had almost 13,000 people that had visited their house, their yard, that year. Uh, in 38, they moved there year-round. Uh, they used to host garden club meetings. They'd have the statewide garden clubs meet there. The first one was in 1938. The coffee shop opened in 39. Um, this is a typo on there, but in August of 39, they had 26,000 people visiting year to date. First souvenir shop opened in 1940. Um, second souvenir shop opened in 51. In 54, the big refreshment hut opened. Now this surprised me. Um, in 1954, they had 88,000 visitors that year. In, 80, in 90, 1956, they had 80,000. In 57, they had 78,000. They had another 80,000 in 58. So I guess I would argue that the 50s were their peak years. Um, I mean, you think about that. That's incredible, the amount of people coming through that place. In 1955, the museum opened up. Um, I should back up. On 54, back in 1954, I think that was probably their peak year because they had a lot of people coming, but they did a lot of different things then, too. They had, I think, the largest number that ever went in there that ever visited the park in one day was a Sunday in July of 1956, or 54, I'm sorry, where there were 6,500 people came in on that one day. I mean, I can't even imagine that, and I work there. Uh, in 54, also, he opened, he kept it open after Labor Day. He'd always open it Memorial Day and close it Labor Day. In 54, people were clamoring about, well, we still want to come here in the fall, so they kept it open after Labor Day until it got too cold. In 65, Teddy Wawa was the property adjacent to the park. It was on the other side of the road that cut the park in half. And they bought that in 1965. 
that was a whole separate resort type area. They used to have rowboats and stuff on Pope Lake. But that never quite made it into the 60s, and it certainly didn't make it in 65 when Hildegard's bought it. And they never did too, they never did too much with that. Um, they kind of kept that natural. Right, guys? I mean, that was, that's where the campground was. It was a campground for a year or two. Mm -hmm. Now, on August 18th, 1966, Chris Hildegard died. He had heart problems, and he died of a heart attack that summer. Um, but the story always went, when he left Chicago, and he was on heart medications and stuff, and the story was, I don't know if it's true or not, but it was often repeated, when he came up here, he threw his <coughs> medicine away and said, the pines are my medicine. <laughs> well, it must have been something to it, because he lasted until 66. Um, that's when Casey moved up, took over. Um, the, uh, I'm not going to get into the windstorm, we'll talk about that. In 75, Emma passed away, and that was the end of it. In July, I think it was January 4th, I'm sorry. She passed away, and that was the end of it. And that's when the park was turned over to the state. The dedication was that May. The state had it shut down for two years while they renovated it or dismantled it, I guess I should say, um, and opened it again two years later in the summer of 77. Uh, the map, let's run through this real quick, remind you where everything was. You come off Whispering Pines Road, you had the main road going in the parking lot that still exists. There was a secondary gravel <coughs> road that ran alongside that. Uh, Casey's home was right at the edge of the park. It was a cottage, well, it was a full scale house. They called it a cottage, but it was a, a year-round house. You walked up, on the right-hand side, there was a private property there that ended up, I don't know where that went, but it was gone after the state took it over. You had the big playground there. Uh, towards Marl Lake from the playground, you had the annex, which was a second souvenir shop. This was not as big as the, fir the, the main one, which was farther down the road. Then you had the refreshment hut. And then you had that big picnic area back in there. And these areas were all full of pea gravel. They'd all been covered with pea gravel. As Joe and Dennis and anybody else that worked big grounds knows about, which we'll get into a bit later. Down the road a little farther, there's a private, there still is a private residence on there. And these folks came from Chicago, that's the Hildegards. They were part of this Barrington group, which was a group of investors out of Illinois, the Chicago area. They purchased all the land in the 1920s from Beasley Creek out to Rural Road. And they subdivided it into what we call Shishi Pecomio Park. And that's where a lot of the places, our place included, was part of that subdivision. It was all kind of platted out. Ended up by, I'd say, the 40s and into the 50s, Hildegard ended up owning pretty much all the property on Marl Lake, with a few exceptions, uh, which they sold off over the years and ended up, by the time we showed up on the scene to work there, they pretty much just owned Whispering Pines Park proper. But on the other side of the lake, just past the boat landing, as you go out towards Rural Road, there was a there was a big section in there. I don't know how many acres it was because it was kind of long and narrow, but it was the Whispering Pines Park Wildlife Refuge. And he kept that basically native and let animals, they had deer in there and everything else. It kind of broke my heart because now it's part of Hartman Creek Park and they were allowing deer hunting in there, which would probably have them turning over in their grave, but it is what it is. So anyway, then you go past the private property there, back into the Hildegard domain. You come down the road, the garage was on the left, the house was behind it. There were a couple storage sheds there. And it was at the back of the house where that stairway goes down, that was the one that was built in 32, to the pier, the boathouse. And they had those covered wagons down there, if you remember those. And I think, I don't know for sure, but it, it seems like those were, if not the most photographed pieces of, of park stuff, uh, they were close to it. I think we had our pictures in there. I think everybody did at one time or another. If you went down to the lake, the path curved around following the lake shore. And there was a wishing well there, as 
very little kids. We always thought we were going to make a lot of money and snuck in there and tried to find pennies. But it, was all, it was all mud and weeds, and we just got nothing but dirty out of it. Then there was a little mill uh, with little dwarfs on there and a spring. There was a spring that came down there. Um, and then it crossed over a little bridge, and there was a gazebo on the shore of the lake, too. Then past that, there was a stairway that went up to the museum. I'm sorry, it went up to the main souvenir shop before it got to the museum. That's where the main souvenir shop was, and we'll have pictures of that pretty quick. The museum, uh, between the museum and the Hildegard's home was, a, was an area called Linger Lane. Again, more pea gravel. A lot of flowers, a lot of chairs. Uh, people sat there, a couple of fountains, big fountains, things like that. So that's pretty much the map of the, the park as I remembered it back probably circa 1966. Um, by the time I got there, and by the time these guys got there, there wasn't a whole lot of development done anymore. I mean, there was an awful lot of development done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But by the time the 60s came around, they were, they'd slowed down a little bit. Chris and Emma were more than happy just to sit and visit with people. Um, they still added some things. There were playground equipment added when I was there. Um, but by the time the 60s came closer to an end, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the time was spent maintaining things, fixing things, kind of salvaging stuff, kind of holding it together. Now, I think as much as anything, but I think there's some back to it. It served a niche back, like I said, during the Depression and the Second World War. And after that, you get into the 50s and things were pretty good. I mean, in addition to family-oriented stuff being the, the focus, people had more money, people had more mobility, so you had more people coming. A lot of the people we got at the park came from the camps, too. We have school buses full of kids coming from Onway and um, Tamarack and all over the place. The, um, that was... was by water. Yeah, oh yeah. In yeah. those days it was not kayaks like we have now. It was aluminum <laughs> things back with the right to the Yeah. There'd yeah. be regular yeah. flotillas of them coming. <laughs> but anyway, my point is that uh, people were into that. And they, as like I said before, they could come somewhere, they didn't have to spend any money. The money they did spend was what they did voluntarily. They wanted souvenirs, they paid for them. They wanted a hamburger or an ice cream bar for a dime, they'd get it, you know. But they could come and spend the whole day there with the kids not spending money. Somewhere in the 60s, things changed, though, as we all know. Um, the chain was booming. You had pontoon boats, you had nightclubs, you had all kinds of other stuff going on. And the big chain became more sexy than the little chain. So more people started doing that. We got out of the more of the pristine, docile types of entertainment. Um, you had Fort Wapaka, later the Ponderosa open up as competitors, kind of. Um, but I think that ha that was happening. Chris Hildegard died, and that started to trigger the beginning of the end, I think. Okay, so with that being said, um, <clears throat> do you want to, how do you folks want to do this? Do you want to take a break somewhere along the line, or do you want to just get it, move around whatever you want? All right, we'll keep going. <laughs> My goal here, I need a couch. <laughs> you know, I've been here since 53. You know how old I am. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, um, again, we want to hear your, your stories and your memories and your thoughts about this, but let me share you ours first here. Um, in 1963, I started working there unofficially. And my boss was... What's the matter? Oh, okay. Anyway, my boss was a guy, well, besides Chris Hildegard, my, my self-appointed foreman was a guy named Bob Schmaltz, who was our neighbor. And Bob was quite a character. He and I got along real well. But I remember the first day I worked there, there were two sets of outdoor outhouses, of toilets. And uh, I said, my job was to clean them out. So he gives me a short shovel. Oh. <laughs> Tells me to go dive. <laughs> I didn't know if I should cry or get mad or quit or what, but then he laughed and said, no, no, you don't have to do that. 
<laughs> but anyway, <laughs> those, those are kind of fun days because I'd worked with Bob and Chris, and it was just us, basically. Um, Bob's, Bob's day off was Tuesday, and Chris and Emma would always go into town on Tuesday. So on Tuesdays, I was in charge. <laughs> And I got to sneak off and drive that little tractor they had. <laughs> but anyway. Red wheel horse. Yeah. With the trailer. Yeah. Yeah, the problem with the trailer is every time I was with Bob, he drove and I had to ride the trailer and I felt kind of stupid as a 14-year-old boy riding around in this little trailer. Especially <laughs> these 14-year-old girls around, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the process was this. You get up in the morning, the uniform of the day was jeans, boots, t-shirt, flannel shirt if it was cooler, and we always had to have a pocket knife, matches, and peanuts in our pockets. Nuts were for the squirrels, chipmunks, which was constantly a part of the job. You fed them. Uh, matches were for burning trash. So we start at 8 o'clock. We go over there. We go to the house, get the working orders for the day. We should have a list of stuff out there. First order of business, we had to police the grounds for trash. So we pick up trash and stuff. I do that, empty the trash bins. Now there was a couple couple of things they had going there as part of the trash collection system. They had 55 gallon barrels that you guys still used back then, um, where you dump all the, people were supposed to throw all the garbage in there from the picnics and stuff. And some did, some didn't. But we would collect the trash and throw it in the barrels. They also had, I don't know if you remember now, but they used to have little black cast iron pots on hangers, strategically down the road, around the area. And people would put cigarette butts, cigar butts, um, trash in there. Unfortunately, a lot of times they put in gooey candy <coughs> and melted ice cream, so that got kind of nasty. But anyway, we had to throw the stuff into the, dump all that stuff into the 55 gallon barrels, haul it to the incinerator, which was down there by the playground of all things, and burn all that stuff. So we get that trash cleaned up, then we had to rake the gravel, pea gravel. And we had special double wide rakes where you drag it along behind you because the lines had to be straight, pine needles all had to be off. They had replaceable tines. You could actually take these things off in pairs yeah. and get replacement tines if they got ruined. I've never, seen, I've never seen them before or since, but then again, I was so traumatized, I don't think I ever looked for them. <laughs> and it, but the point was well taken that it's supposed to look nice, but the problem was 10 minutes after we raked it, people came through and you never know the difference. But anyway, that was what it was. So it was all clean up, raking. Then the job was to kind of go through the flower beds, type the begonias. Well, the begonias, at first they started planting up to 500 begonias a year. At the end, it was 650. And they, <coughs> and they would have the big rolls going from the museum to the souvenir shop had the most of them in there, but they were all over the place too. They had a nice rose garden down by the lake, by the gazebo. So the flowers were a big deal, but the way we had to deal with that is they were drooping. You had these green little wooden stakes. We would take that, these little green twist ties, and tie the little thing up, <laughs> and then snap off again. But anyway, <laughs> that was the job. Then every third day we had to water them, and they had an intricate underground watering system. He had piping in there. I, they did, I mean, it was incredible. That's the way he had it set up. But we'd have to water the flowers and stuff like that, too. Then we'd break for lunch. And then in the afternoon, the afternoon was either some special project or painting or fixing something. As again, like I said, by this time, even by the mid-60s, things were starting to kind of need a lot of attention or need more attention than they used to. Um, we work from 8 in the morning till about 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon. I have no idea what I made in 1963. I think it was about $30. But in 64, my first W-2, my first Social Security report was from 1964. That whole summer I made $164 working for it. <laughs> but Jan, what did you get for working in the, in the museum? I got a dime. <laughs> no, you did. You did. I got a horse. Yes, you did. I did. They had these, uh, they're like briar horses, you know, kind of horse statue. I still have it. White, standing up. I had lost it after that horse. It cost $5. I couldn't afford it. And finally, at the end of the summer, they gave it. <laughs> 
So anyway, um, the, the process would go for the rest of the employees though, they'd come in at nine o'clock. That's when they'd get the cash drawers and they'd get their instructions for the souvenir shops, for the hut and things like that. They'd go to the house, get that, and go down and set up a shop. Um, the other things I'd have to do occasionally, if it was really busy in the refreshment stand, in the refreshment hut, I'd have to help out in there. I could open pop bottles. I could sell, I couldn't sell, I could, I could hand out potato chips. I could never work the cash register, which was a real relic even then. Um, the hamburgers and hot dogs were way beyond me, you know, as far as cooking them. But I'd have to help out in there once in a while, and that was kind of fun, it was kind of different. The one job I really didn't like, though, in the big souvenir shop, it was set on the hill, kind of overlooking where the channel comes into Marl Lake. And there was a basement underneath there. And that's where the storeroom was for all the souvenirs. Well, I'd get a list, and I could hardly read it. And I'd have to go in there, and they had one light bulb in the whole thing. And you had to work your way through the smell of the cedar, the moccasins, everything else, and try to figure out what was what in here. And I hated that. It was just terrible. I get claustrophobic in there. Do you guys ever have to do that? Yeah. What kind of souvenirs did they sell? Oh, Jan, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> we had great souvenirs. Um, lots of little cedar boxes, which you thought of later. Everybody makes, and everybody sells everywhere. But I thought these were special with certain kinds of art ones because they had a sticker on them. Um, lots of jewelry. Lots yeah. of turquoise. There's some really nice stuff. Yeah, actually the jewelry was, was kind of a highlight. Really, really cool things. Um, I think we sold cigarettes. Oh, and cigars. There were cigars. lots of cigars yeah. sold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, First smoke cigars. Um, yeah, yeah. Lots of ashtrays with clever kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, off color. Off color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which we never quite figured out how our grandma dealt with that. Yeah. I yeah, didn't get discussed much at home. No. <laughs> uh, lots of postcards with the same kind of uh, little sayings that I didn't understand at the time. Um, yeah, what else? Well, the moccasins, the moccasins, a lot of moccasins were sold out, and nice ones. Very all good. these, Very all these stuff were moccasins and jewelry, mm -hmm. and yeah. they, there were a couple of antique clocks. The museum had an extensive collection of antique clocks. Those of you who were there will probably remember that as one of the highlights. Uh, there were a few mantle clocks that they sold in the souvenir shop. I'll tell you, I remember what they cost, because I thought it was a lot of money at the time. Thirty dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I remember things like uh, fake spears with rubber heads. Lots of uh, Native American themed things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tomahawks. Yeah. Purses. We also had the brown bags. In the middle of the store, under the postcard rack, were brown paper lunch bags, basically, stapled shut for 50 cents, and you never quite knew what you were going to get. It could be something pretty nice, like a wooden bird statuette or something, and then again, it could be a giant cigar. <laughs> they did have those, those all-day yeah. cigars. It was like... Yeah. <laughs> now, that was the other thing with Chris. He smoked cigars a lot. He was, he was quite a character. I don't know if anybody knew him or, or ever saw him. He was short, stocky, and uh, he had hearing aids in both ears, but he was quite the character. He was a great guy. Um, what am I missing with the, I think those were pretty much my duties there and stuff. They, uh, like I said, it, it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people there, especially on the weekends, as you heard from the numbers that was thrown out before. Saturdays and Sundays were their biggest days. July and August, of course, were their busiest months. Um, how they accommodated all those people. You know, when we went back there now, or we go back there, we cannot imagine how everything fit in there. Everything looks so much smaller, let alone putting 6,500 people in the middle of that a day. How the heck that worked, I have no clue, but it did, you know. It did. Where did those wonderful white pines come from? The Trees that were there? Yeah. Oh, they were native to there. The big ones. They were, they're, they're, they're kind of 
Some of those were in the 80s and 90 foot range, still are. Yeah, a lot less than there were, though. Right. Maybe that'd be a good lead into you guys. You want to talk about that windstorm? You want to go? This? Yeah, let's do the slides, then we'll go to the windstorm. Yeah. What sure some of these things look like then? Um, this is back when the hut first, or uh, Whispering Pines hut first opened. There's Emma. Oh. This is before she died. Yeah, this was just a couple of years ago. We didn't really have a better picture of her in our collections. This is from a, a newspaper story. There's the playground. There's the playground. The building in the far background you can kind of make out is the hut. And over here is the annex. That's the early picture of the picnic grove behind the hut. One thing that, um, when I worked there in 1968, uh, I didn't do much different than what Jeff has already described. It was pretty much a routine, especially for the younger helpers, to sort of, uh, you know, helping keep up with regular maintenance. It was mostly trash collecting, raking, lots of raking. Uh, odd jobs of various sort. Every now and then you get a major project. And the reason I mention this now is that this picture reminds me of one. If you look at these picnic tables, some of them look pretty normal, but a lot of them were built with these posts. So that both the seats and the tabletop were mounted straight into the ground on posts. So we spent a lot of time with post hole diggers and uh, whatever, because when you replace those, it was a project. Well, a rod, of course. you not only had the rod, but you had frost heaves and everything else for that, so yeah. you could have one where you That's probably the most famous phone. We have in that photo album I've got back there, I've got probably five or six different renditions of this over the years. That was one thing about this. There's a lot of photos in there that are the same thing, but if you look close, uh, the details are different. The park was always changing. It was always, something was always under construction. Chris was always doing something different, adding something, taking something away. You know, it, it was always changing from one year to the next. Sometimes in little ways. At the end, it wasn't like that, but back in the heyday, it was. Yes, please. Oh. When, when, when the Hill parents donated it to the state, what happened to all the stuff that was there? Did the state just it take went, it all down? I mean, yeah, well, the uh, the covered wagons? everything went, went for sale at a two day auction mm -hmm. in June of 75. Mm -hmm. and 75? 75. And my wife, Chris, and I went to that, and I couldn't take it. I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it after. How about everything in the museum? Same. Every, same. It all went. It was a two-day auction. All everything the big in the museum. Stones went. outside and everything. Mm -hmm. The big rocks. Everything's gone. Everything was taken. They sold. I don't know how many hundreds of birdhouses they sold. Everything down to the vehicles. Everything in the museum. They. Um, all those rock formations. Everything in the playground. Some of that went. I did hear from somebody in Wisconsin Rapids who had gotten two of the covered wagons, and he was a friend of his had a, I think it was a golf course over there where they had a bunch of this stuff, from <coughs> the rock formations and stuff, that they, and the, the split rail fences and things like that, they, they took over there. But yeah, everything went, it was incredible. And the auction went fast, for two full days there was so much stuff, it went so fast. Um, so everything went, now the Hildegards gave the land to the state, but the, the, the East State got everything above ground of their property. And Casey got some of that money out of that, but there was also, I believe, a nephew and maybe a niece who we never knew or even heard of until after the passing of Emma, who inherited a lot of this, the money that came out of this. Um, but the state got everything, and after the whole place was cleaned out, they went to town and they tore down the buildings. Everything. Had to so be, the state tore down the buildings? They had, to, they had to take the buildings out in pieces because they couldn't get because of the trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. I do know of an individual who told me he bought the museum. And it last I heard was a, a cottage down by Wild Rose. But they had taken that out in sections. Mm -hmm. I know they took Casey's house out of there. Yeah, but they took that, yes, a whole, so a whole yeah, entirely. Yeah, well, um, put it on a truck and I don't know where it went. But yeah, everything everything was gone. Plus, they had to rip up all the piping and stuff underground, and uh, it it's 
was incredible how that changed so fast. Except and I, the slim dog out too, until people yeah, yeah. really upset, and then they put one back in. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And they did that again lately, the last several years, because they felt it was being abused, and everybody said, no, we don't want that, so they had to put it back in. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, they broke up all those fountains that he had made and stone structures and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I found out where they dumped those, and I've got a whole bunch of pieces. Oh, really? Yeah, really? that's not anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Interesting. <laughs> but yeah, see that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was incredible how, it was incredible that it all went. And some of the stuff, I mean, it wasn't your regular auction by any means. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. When I was curator of Hutchinson House in the 70s, I remember hearing that the Penny House on Main Street had had a fountain that was children with an umbrella. And just seeing this, and I don't remember this out there, but I was just wondering if there was any possibility that he could have gotten this from there somehow. Oh, could be. Could very well be. Nobody seems to know whatever happened. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. See, I've got some big gaps in my memory, plus there's a big chunk of time I don't know. Because I, at the time, like I said, I was kind of discouraged with that whole auction and how that all went down. I saw a part of it. Yeah. Was that something? Sad. Yeah. Especially when they started taking out personal stuff in this house. Yeah. And, you know, I struggle with that like a lot of people did because I really was hoping it would stay the same way it would. And I know Emma wanted it that way and they'd set it up that way. Um, and I didn't go back in there for 12 years after that. I couldn't. But then I started changing my thinking a little bit and figuring, all right, it wasn't exactly what the Hildegards wanted. They wanted to keep it going like it had been. But face it, there was no way the state could do that. And no way the state would, and they couldn't. Um, and there was no way you were going to get around Char not charging people to come in there. The state owned it. And of course, state government, like every other government, you're at the you're at the mercy of budgets and everything else and you know, that wouldn't have lasted. So I, I I changed my thinking to where it's at now and I'm thinking, all right, this is the best that could have happened considering everything. It went back to how it was when they came. It's a nice place for people to go and just relax and chill out. Um, in my mind it's kinda of how it probably was when they moved there. And it's kind of how Mother Nature comes back to kind of claim its own. And you know, we've been in there, and Joel always says, he can't find a piece of pea gravel for the life of him. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I can. I actually spent time rooting around looking for pea gravel. <laughs> yes, I was there somewhere. <laughs> you ought to see him root, too. He's fun. Huh? <laughs> Practice makes perfect. <laughs> okay, so where are we now? There, that's Linger Lane. This is the original coffee shop. And that actually stayed on the property. The state didn't take that down until later. They used it for storage for tools and stuff, but then it started getting vandalized. So they took it down a number of years ago. But this is Linger Lane, and that statue was over in here that we're talking about. But these chairs, they were all over the park. <laughs> there, I don't know how many, hundred of them? Hundreds of them? Oh, those, the, those chairs, and the other things that they had a lot of around the playground area were these seats that Chris had made out of tractors, metal tractor seats with a concrete base and an eye bar. And those are all homemade. What would happen is they close the place down. After they moved here, they close the place down. They need work all winter building stuff. Do you have more pictures of them? They're all in the what book back there. Oh, but not here? No, I don't think so. What else do you want to watch? I've got your chairs. The chairs, no. The oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those, you know what those were? Yeah, from Mason Jarvis. And those signs, those those backs were road signs. <laughs> yeah, they painted over the old road signs, and they. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those games were uh, there were several throughout the playground and picnic areas, and they were like Mason jar rubber ceiling rings that they used for. <laughs> There's the clocks in the museum. Yeah. But there were guns. There were all kinds of antiques. There were all kinds of stuffed animals. I remember one time a guy I know from the DNR called me up because they found a guy that had a stuffed bald eagle and wanted to know if it, he said he got it from the 
Whispering Pines auction, and I said, yeah, there was one there. I think that probably could have been it. It's probably the most famous piece of taxidermy in the museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that went to the University of Wisconsin. Did they find those deer on the property? I honestly don't know. I don't know where they found Yeah, they were on the property. Were they? There's the old milk truck. Anybody remember that? Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I have that. It doesn't look like that at all. It's kind of in bad shape. She gave that to me in 1968. Yeah, that was that was actually still functional in the mid 60s. Yeah, yeah. I remember you you and Dennis were working when Lenny and I took that out of there in 68. No, that was back at that point. I was back behind the museum, next to the museum. If we go back to the, oops, if we go back. <laughs> this is kind of counterintuitive because the top button is actually backwards. Um, the truck. Okay, here's the museum. The truck was actually parked right about there. Everything on this side of the road was the old Caddy Wawa property. This was the old uh, refreshment stand for Caddy Wawa, which was pink. <laughs> pink cinder black. We never used the premium storage, but it had been the refreshment stand there. This was the old uh, house on that property, and by the time, uh, or by the mid to late 60s, after the old judge bought it, they used it as kind of a guest house. Uh, visitors from Chicago, friends that they have up and stay there, or workers, seasonal workers sometimes shared it out. So this end of the property really wasn't trafficked by the public very much at all. It was okay to go down here to the Pope Lake frontage, but very few people did. So we didn't spend much attention trying to maintain or police that grounds. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, uh, the truck was stored right back here by the museum at that point. This area here is where the campground was for that couple of years. Where's the current swimming dock located? The current swimming dock is right here. Oh, okay. It's in the exact same spot as the original one. Right at the end of the stone stairs, which is the last surviving piece, except for the concrete platform for the left. Where was Casey's? Was that the house on the right? Sorry? Casey's? Was that the Casey's house on the right? Casey's was on the left. It's right on here. On the left. Okay. Yeah, if you came up, uh, this is actually buyer's property. The individual yeah. donated the photos. Yeah. It was just adjacent to that. Oh. On the left, kind of back behind the play, uh, behind the playground. If you were to and what was on the right? Because was that house when you first there you yeah. start walking on the trail that's right to the right and that yeah. disappears not that guys. long ago. Don't know who that was. Oh. And it's gone. That floated on Manaman Lake right yeah. here. Okay. Uh, if you were to draw the uh, hillside that goes down to the lake, it would run roughly like this. Yeah, pictures of that. I remember that. Very, it's just staring at it for hours. All those mm -hmm. little doodads. We have pictures of it uh, right on the hillside. Um, um, we have some somewhere. Not in this slideshow, but yeah, but in the. Uh, not in the slideshow, but in the book. Uh, yeah. They're particularly there, and in the albums that's out there, there are some from the early years. The very first thing that they developed as a rock garden was actually not where the one that. It ended up. It was the hillside down, kind of above the covered wagons. So back yeah. in the 30s, that was actually the original rock garden area. And there was a bird bath down in there and a bunch of formations. But you don't have pictures except in the book. Oh, you don't have pictures except in the book. Right. Right. Well, right. Album. There's a bit of an old foundation that's still left. Yeah, there is. There yeah. is. There is. I'm not sure what that is. So that's the truck. Uh, this is the Linda Lane again. Um, they innovated quite a bit. Uh, oh, yeah. Farm materials. Yeah. Anybody know what these are? That's the fence. Those are coffin handles. <laughs> he had. He had a truckload of coffin handles, and they not only made the fence out of it, they made benches out of them too. There's a souvenir shop. 
Yeah. <laughs> Where are the infamous begonias? Now, a couple of things here. Show them the flag, Joel. Oh, the flag? Yeah. yeah. That flag, at the time, there were 48 states, and they put that up there. Every star had a stone from the state it represented. Wow. And those correspondence tables, there's several different pictures of those. Uh, originally, they had thatched huts or thatched roofs. Uh, yeah, these were originally thatched. And um, people would buy their postcards. They'd get stamps. They'd write out of the correspondence table. And over here, there was a covered, little covered wagon on a stone pedestal. And one of my jobs was every day before I quit, I had to pick the mail up out of that little box or that little covered wagon and it said U.S. mail on it and take it out to the road to the big mailbox. So it was quite the delivery system. In that picture there looking towards the lake, was the, there was a real big tree that was hit by lightning on the corner of George Lake and Taylor. And oh, yeah, 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 right yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That was moved in that spot, It's, right? yeah, it's, it's over. To the left there. Yeah, we have a picture of that in the book. It, it, was, a, it was a 400 year old pine. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a slightly better view of the flag. And you can't really yeah. see it, but the, those are all inside the stone stars. And that's the stairway there going down to the lake. Right there. there was another one that came up at the back of the souvenir shop and went directly into it. And that's where their, their people counter was. They had a system set up where you'd step on a step and it would count through there. <laughs> and then they also had a, um, a, a book, a visitor log, that they kept at one of the tables there. This is just a representative shot of, of one of the things that was in the rock garden. And this is uh, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Then there was George Washington, and there was an eagle, too. What else was there? Yeah, there was an eagle, and there was George Washington, and uh, uh, there are photos in that album and, and around the, some of the other ones. I just pulled this one up randomly, pretty much. There's the infamous staircase, and that's where we heard his house at the top. This staircase, this, not the railings, but the actual steps still exist. Go down the Joel, hit on the windmill, man. Yeah. That was one of our jobs, too. Oh, yeah. Every morning we had to go down the lake and check things out, and I always had to clean trash out of that windmill. Because there were little doors, and everybody would stick stuff in there, and it was always like <laughs> gooey ice cream wrappers and stuff, and gum. Yeah, they built this so the little doors actually functioned. So, of course, that's where you found your pop bottles. And, you know. and pop bottles were all returnable in those days. So we had to go around collecting them. They stacked them in wooden cases along the back side of the hut. So, and of course, when we burned the trash, we had to go through and sort out the pop bottles. Pretty much burned everything and sorted it up later. Speaking of burning, real quick, burning trash in those 55-gallon barrels, one of the hazards of that was dealing with baby raccoons. The babies would get in there and they couldn't get out. So every morning you had to be careful. I learned that the hard way because I reached in and got one once and it got me. But I, uh, <laughs> I had this brilliant idea. I was going to take one home to the cottage and raise it as a pet. So I had gloves, so I'm carrying it and it starts spitting and peeing on me and it's just all over the place. <laughs> Mildred put the kibosh on that. <laughs> I, I don't think the team would like that either. <laughs> there are the wagons. Yeah, and that would be the pier over here and the boat house right there. Ah. Oh, yeah, there's the mill. The and mill the um, through a piping system, these figurines are pouring water through a uh, a windmill, or a, sorry, a water mill thing here, and it actually worked uh, sometimes. By the time I was there, that was another point of repeated repair. Uh, and that's the little bridge that, that uh, Jeff referred to a little while ago on the lake shore. Line. So you go past the wishing well. If you went to the bottom of the stairs, the boat also would be directly in front of you. You took a right, the wishing well would be on your right, and further on, also on the right, would be this display and this little bridge over the spring. You can that way. Or you can go up the hill for the souvenir shop. Mm -hmm. the, this is the lake shore flower bed. So this is down, you were walking along and you were going by the uh, 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 
past the uh, wishing well and boathouse would be back in here. What would be on your left, the lake would be over here, would be another big flower bed. And I don't know about that and with you guys, but when I worked there, that was the only piece of grass in the whole park we ever mowed. <laughs> seriously, seriously, it was the only piece of grass. Yeah, I mowed that once, I know. Oh, it's just one of these benches that's what that's made out of. Yeah, right, right. Same thing. <laughs> There's the pier. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did you know? <laughs> there's the infamous oatmeal machines with the sign that said, Tame yeah. fish, do not molest. Yep. The sign up there actually read, Tame fish, please do not molest. <laughs> and actually, there is Chris feeding the fish. Yes, yes. With a cigar. With a cigar. <laughs> That's the gazebo from the lake. Uh, so if you're out on Marl Lake looking at the part, the channel to Pope Lake is over here, roughly. And sort of the last thing on the lake shore path. <coughs> you curve around and come up that back stairs up the hill into the souvenir shop, <coughs> roughly back in there. Which isn't there. I mean, that's not there either anymore. And this is what it looks like today, of course. At the front. That was the thing about the time then. At the time, up to and including 74, I guess, the gates were never locked. There were no chains. There were no signs setting hours. There was no keep out signs. There was a sign that said no alcohol allowed in the park. But during the time I was there, I know it changed a little bit towards the end of the 60s and then the 70s, but there was absolutely no problem at all. There was no trouble at all in the park. Chris would say, for the first 26 years he was there, he said, I never had to call the police or the sheriff's department in 26 years. Never been a problem. And there wasn't. I mean, we had no problems at all. I think by the end of the 60s, things started to get a little bit weird. People were coming in there, parking in the parking lot, partying and things like that. Um, Casey, the caretaker at the time, took it upon himself to patrol the parking lot at night. And that got a, got a little tense sometimes. And <laughs> carried a gun. <laughs> Um, but it, the, the point I'm making is back in those days, there was no problem at all there whatsoever that I was aware of or ever heard of. Now, of course, it's a different world we live in. Um, you want to be done with that part of it? Yeah. Okay. You want to talk about the windstorm? Yeah. Uh, yeah. While we're talking about. Well, we've been at this an hour now, so uh, if, if uh, folks are getting where they'd like to share more or wrap up or whatever we can certainly start thinking along those lines. But a couple of things quickly, uh, since I'm on the slideshow anyway, if you are interested in this, and some of you here probably are already members of the Facebook page. We have a Facebook page for sharing memories. And I'm going to have to, uh, I don't know I can really show it because it just goes to mind. I've never been able to figure out the Facebook addresses. Um, if you just uh, search Mystery Pines Park. <laughs> Whispering yeah, Pines Park, the name of the page is Whispering Pines Park, Wapaka Memories. And there are 33 members already. It's allegedly a closed group in the someone who's the administrator is supposed to process the request for membership. That's the administrator. I just click OK. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is it doesn't really, it's not really necessary anyway. I, I go on and I see people who are telling you without any of oh. them. That's fine. You, know, you just did that kind of capriciously, I suppose. But the point of it is, is that there is a page set up on Facebook that was designed specifically for folks like yourselves who have some memories or some interest to go and find out a little bit more, post some of your information if you want to share it, post some of your memories if you want to share it, share them, um, uh, see what else is out there, put up some photos, see what other people have put up, um, and start some dialogue. And it's easy, and it's, if you're on Facebook, then I understand that there are reasons that maybe you not want to do that these days. I can think of some. <laughs> <laughs> He's not on Facebook. <laughs> but but uh, it does exist, and it's there for the use of people such as yourselves who have an interest that maybe some uh, specific memories or 
or resources, but they want to make more generally available to the telecast community. Like events or, or, or um, worry about being organized ahead of time necessarily, or those sorts of things. What's the story behind the tree that someone mentioned? Yeah. Came down. I think you know more about it than I do. That was. Uh, it was. I liked it. Uh, they uh, estimated the, the, the how old it was then, and then Hildegard wanted to transfer to the park. Mm -hmm. And it was hit by lightning on the corner of Taylor and George Lake, mm -hmm. and they floated it. I remember. Mm -hmm. to get it there. Yep. So they replanted it. No, no. It was. It was just a big section of, of the tree. It was like, and I couldn't even like tell. Yeah, yeah, but it was huge. I mean, like yeah. There, there is a picture of it in, is, that, is this in here? Yeah, there's one in there and one in the, uh, in the main book, I know. Anyway, the thing is huge. And it was, I think, estimated to be 400 years old or something. It was a monster. <laughs> oh, oh, they ordered it on the cement pedestal and put it back sort of amongst the, uh, sort of amongst the rock. <laughs> So it was right at the corner of Hildegard's house. If you know, if you're facing the house, you can go down the left hand side and make a bend around the end of the staircase and create it. When did that happen? No, that's all gone. I thought you wanted to know what happened to it. I have no clue what happened to it. When did that tree get moved there? I, I don't know. Um, do you have any idea when the tree got moved, ma'am? You're um, no, I, I, re I remember it was in my, during my I lifetime. I had to say early 60s. Yeah, I, I remember seeing it. I remember hearing about it being floated, and I remember them putting it up there, but I couldn't remember the day. But it was, that was pretty incredible. Yes? It looked like a magnifying glass. The prism. The prism, yes. Yeah. I made some did you? Yeah, I had to clean rolls once in a while. Yes, I don't know if it was a tornado or just straight line wind, but it was very uh, devastating. In fact, if you look really carefully, when you go through the channels on the upper chain, you can still see some overturned roots and stuff. Uh, there were big, until a few years ago, you could see the peanut piles down by the road at the Worcester Park uh, uh, parking lot. It was uh, pretty impressive. The, you could not get the rural road to Worcester Pines Park. Too many trees down over the road. Power was out. Um, and also, so, it happened during the day. So, there were a lot of people at the park. They pretty much crammed into the souvenir shop, which was dark. <laughs> and yeah, it was kind of scary. They had a lot of. Uh, um, Power was also there was a lot of spoilage for the, uh, the hut supplies. We dealt with that by eating as much ice cream as possible. Uh, always taking a sacrifice. The, the, uh, uh, a lot of crews came in, not just the power crews, but uh, they, they brought in people to do, you know, like cutting up, clean up. I was only 13 years old at the time, and I was allowed to use a chainsaw all day, every day. But not felling trees, just working on Show me you still have all your fingers. So. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Um, the uh, uh, only, it was, it was a mess. It took the better part of that season <laughs> to clean up. What measure that? 1968. Do you so, remember how long the power was out? I do not. It was days. It was days. You were there. No. <laughs> the only significant damage I remember is that a tree came down into the garage. They had parked the pickup truck and the, the car. The Hildegard's car was a 1956 Buick, two-tone green. And, yeah, and uh, they had a 1957 International Harvester pickup truck, which was the camp truck. That's what we took to the dump and such like. They were parked side by side in the garage. The tree came down between us and not damage either vehicle. 
didn't even get all the way through the garage because there were power lines there, so it looked like a violin bridge. <laughs> and they had a, uh, a crew come in to deal with that, obviously. Uh, the, but other than the garage, the only other thing that happened was uh, Esther Schramm was the woman who worked full time at the hut, ran this refreshment stand in those days. And uh, Esther was a very powerful person. Um, she had to be some of the antics that some of the rest of us pulled. But um, the only other thing that happened was Esther's car got squashed. Yeah, she, uh, her car got hit, and that in the garage, and I, that's the one I remember. Do you remember anything else? I think some of those truck things got blown over. Yeah? Yeah, the, the top of them got blown yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. And there was one tree that was one of these big, huge truck pines that did not come down. was camping at a significant angle towards the hut. So they sent in a separate crew later to uh, climb up in there and cable it to a couple of other trees. And it stayed like that. It's gone now, but it stayed like that for some years. But you say you had to haul a lot of ice cream into the dump, but you were handing it out. <laughs> but you were handing out ice cream to kids in King or something. Yeah, yeah. And the dump truck trips were a treat. I mean, in, in addition to all the other things that would never pass muster today that, that went on then, uh, when we went to the dump, we'd take these 55 gallon barrels, you know, incinerate everything. And then, of course, we had to get rid of that from time to time. So what do you do? Well. Back in the 55 gallon barrels. So we'd reload the drums with ash and whatever trash we didn't incinerate and take it to the dump. Well, how did we get to the dump? You sit on the tailgate and bounce your feet off the road. As you can buy it. <laughs> I have a quick question. You yeah. have, there were very eclectic things there that I remember, uh -huh. like the squirrels playing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> where did they acquire these eclectic things that were in the museum and around the park? I don't honestly know, but I do know that he, Chris especially, had a lot of connections. And people were bending over backwards to donate things. The bigger his collections got, the more people would donate. Um, he bought a lot of things, granted, because they had a fair amount of money in that. But I, mean, it's, I don't know, I, we were just talking about that earlier today, that, that squirrel card game. Yeah. <laughs> I have no clue where that came from or where it went. I wish I knew because that would be so neat to have. <laughs> I kind of laugh at the fact that I now love collecting weird things. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. The question I have is the private houses that were there, what did those people think of the park right around there? I thought they hated it. <laughs> but I was wrong. Um, we got to know the woman who owned, who lives in that house and has that one house now. The the one that was part his her grandfather was part of the Barrington group that initially established all this. So that's why she was allowed to stay there. And, you know, was her place. They were there first. Anyway, she told me that they, she loved it. It was like her own private little playground. And the the other the older people or the adults, her parents and grandparents, tolerated it pretty well. Now I don't know. I can speak for them. I know buyers like that that lived next to Casey's house there. I don't know anything about the people that lived right when came off the parking lot on the right hand side there, but they were pretty positive about the whole thing. As a matter of fact, this woman that's there now, she said her mother, she only saw her mother cry twice. That's when her dad died and when the park got taken down. But that would be, and it still is a challenge because people still go trooping through there and it's like, you don't have a lot of privacy. It's not like it used to be, but still, it's it's, it's got to be difficult. But they seem to be okay with it. Okay, so we we could talk a lot longer, but we don't want to. We'd like to hear more from you guys. Um, those of you, almost all of you, who've been there, remember it, worked there, or whatever. Can you think of one thing that comes to mind when you think of the old Whispering Pines? Peaceful. Mm -hmm. That's still there. Yeah, that is. That is. That is. And the whispering. Yes. Yes. The smell after rain. There you go. Because we were talking about the senses and stuff, and Joel's always said the sounds are the ones that impact him the most, right? Yeah. The thing that always struck struck me was was the sounds. And well, like your rain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I love the sound of pea gravel in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, the rake for sure, but I can still remember when, when almost, there's some wildlife sounds, but not many because it was, you know, busy, there were people running around, a few birds, I recall, um, but the playground sounds especially, what the swing sounded like when they squeak, what the Peter totter sounded like when it thudded on the bottom, those sorts of things, I have an almost perfect memory. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. One thing that always stuck in my mind, among a million others, but around the hut at, at one time and around the main souvenir shop, they had rows and rows of pinwheels. That has always stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's sort of funny, Jeff and I ended up at a place, we were out on a ride along around Wild Rose and checking out all these lakes, and what was the name of that place that we saw some of the swings? Oh, that by Red Fox and Silver yeah. Lake? Yeah, by Red Fox. Yeah, I think, I think there's some down there. I think most of that stuff stayed, obviously it must have stayed fairly local. Unfortunately, so much time has passed, I bet so much of it is long gone. I used to, you know, go to rummage sales and auctions and stuff around here and souvenir shops gift shops and stuff looking for old um, memorabilia from Mr. Pines and you don't find much anymore at all. You know. We found a bunch of stuff on eBay. That's where I got most of the stuff. That's where I got a lot of the photos actually they were photo postcards. Um, the problem with the photos, a lot of the old ones are just black and white. Um, but the other problem with, with photos that we would try to take in the park, it was so dark in there. Back in the day you couldn't quite get the to come out like you wanted to. Dennis, I think you should tell them about oh. Mrs. Hildegard. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm close enough. <laughs> come up here and tell. <laughs> well, I worked there from uh, 1968 till 71 uh, at, when I was going to high school. I worked for $1.50 an hour, 48 hours a week. And my take home was 56 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably the best job I ever had in my life. Stacy and Emily were some of the greatest people I've ever met. And one of my jobs every morning was to rake that gravel all <laughs> the way around her place and to pick up any kind of garbage. And she would come out uh, to inspect it every morning. And she had this little dog. Oh, <laughs> we got to talk about Will. Wait, 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 wait a second. Terry. This is a second. A trivia question. There was Chris and Emma Hildegard. Did you know there was a third Hildegard? <laughs> Do you know who it was? The dog. The Willie. 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 <laughs> so she'd come out with her cane and she'd go around and she'd point things out to me. Dennis, you know, there's four leaves underneath that bush there. <laughs> she was very meticulous about everything. And as she was walking along, Willie would, he was a big, fat, old dog. <laughs> And every time he stepped, he passed gas. <laughs> <laughs> this was every morning. <laughs> and it was like, oh, goody, the show starts. <laughs> and she would be yelling, Willie, get over here. Get over here. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I had a Oh, there was a lot of good stuff. Why did she tell you to drive your vehicle? Oh, your, your motorcycle. Oh, That's good. Yeah. I, bought a, I bought a motorcycle in, uh, I think, my junior year that I worked for. It was a 305 Scrambler Honda. And I pull it in the park, and I used to park it just out in front of one of the garages. So Mrs. Hildegard came up to me one day, and she says, Dennis, I don't mind you bringing the bike here, but you're going to have to put it in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> it's unsightly to the rest of the school. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I did have a problem. There's a pretty nice turtle that still hangs around here. Do you remember that turtle from when you worked there? No, I don't. I don't. Oh, I've seen a big turtle. Well, we've seen a lot of big turtles in there, but yeah. <coughs> To, to just another comment about Willie, the Boston Terrier, that uh, the routine when I was there, Chris would let him out in the morning, just run around the park before the people came. And Willie didn't go too far, but he'd explore things, you know, a lot of things to smell, a lot of things to check out. Willie, Willie, where are you, Willie? <laughs> <laughs> Forever. 
And Willie would probably be standing behind him or something. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was the morning. The afternoon routine was is Emma would head down to the hut around noon, and then Chris would follow her a little bit later with the Buick, the big Buick, and Willie jumped the back seat. So Willie'd get a ride down to the, the hut, and they'd sit out there with Willie and the Buick sleeping while they visited with everybody else. And then they'd go back to the house later on. Oh, I know another thing I was going to mention. I forgot about the park, the systems there. They had an intricate communication system that consisted of ring uh, crank telephones. Anybody remember those? Every main building had one in there. Um, and they could call from the house to the hut or the hut to the souvenir shop. Depending on how many rings it was, it was it would tell you who you, who they were calling. So I don't remember. I think the house was one, and I don't remember what the best of them were. But that so was that was pretty neat. When I worked in the souvenir shop, we would call ahead, have our lunch ready when I got down there, and it was how far? Well, yeah. Not at all. But yeah, we were very very efficient. That <laughs> and then the hours were never, I guess, consistently set because depending on how many people were in the park, that's when Chris or Emma would call on the phone and tell the hut to shut down, or the souvenir shop to shut down. So it could be anywhere from four o'clock to six o'clock, you know. But yeah, our grandpa worked there for a long time. Mm -hmm. much. There was a story you told about her being in the hut, no, I'm sorry, in the souvenir shop with you when the storm yeah, during the storm. Mm -hmm. girl. Yeah, she was so calm and she was like comforting this little girl that was terrified. Which wasn't me. I was terrified when I was covering it up a little. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like I said, we were all just kind of trapped in there in the dark. But you didn't give them the ice cream. The ice cream was down at the hut. <laughs> yeah, down there into the park. Yeah, so yeah. we were on our way. To Remember, we would have had to call ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. The uh, speaking of storms, there were like three different types of rainstorms that I remember experiencing there. You'd have like an all-day soaker, which usually meant we didn't have to work. Or if there was some inside job to do, we would. <coughs> You'd have these little little minor rainstorms that would come up intermittently and stuff like that. We usually worked through those. But then you'd have the major dark clouds storm that would hit, not to the magnitude of the one that you guys had in 68, but I remember those would come in several times a summer in the afternoon, and that was just a mad rush. It was traffic jams going out of the parking lot. People were just, it, it was crazy. And that shut everything down real quick. So what other memories you got? What other experiences have you had? I, I grew up on Whispering Pines Road, and my parents bought a cottage there. So I was not very old. And I can remember um, after school in the fall time, we would go there. And we had the whole park to ourselves. Oh, yeah. And they had this amazing sl um, slide that was all, like, silver. Oh, yeah. And it had a little bump in the middle of it. It had a cover on the top. Oh, yeah. And the steps to go up, it was so narrow. It was like you were going up, like, two stories high on this slide. <laughs> it was just so cool. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they had, they had a lot of stuff. They had, they had like, big people swings. They had little toddler swings with the safety bars, and then they had the horse swings you talked about. They had a, yeah. little weird horses on springs. Yeah, yeah. 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 They had a couple of merry-go-rounds. They had a big green merry-go-round and a smaller yeah. toddler merry-go-round. They had a toddler too. Did they? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. My mother, when she would take us there, she always marveled at the Hildegards because they, they had no children of their own, but they mm -hmm. had such a love and passion for children. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, she always reminded us every time we went there. And you could tell that, I mean, obviously, we knew it and saw it working there and knowing them and all that, but in the afternoon, when I'd go by there, they would all convene. They'd start sitting in chairs by the hut, but then they'd always convene to a big picnic table. And there was a lot of people around. Yeah. Let me read something to you quick. Um, I think these, these are the eulogies that are printed on the back the post Chris and Emma back upon their death. And I just wanted to close our part of it with this. Um, that it speaks to the very thing we're talking about and what kind of people they were. This 
one here, after Chris died in August of, of 66, an uh, individual named G.H. Stordock, who you might know, Secretary Treasurer of the Wapaka Chamber of Commerce, wrote this for the paper. It's entitled, A Tribute to Chris Hildegard. The Chain Lakes area and the entire Wapaka community mourns the loss of a good friend for the passing of Chris Hildegard, but his memory will linger on. Migrating from Denmark at the early age of 19 years, Chris was an example of the advantages and opportunities offered to industrious individuals from the old country. He purchased a milk business. He operated successfully until his retirement in 1929. He retired at 42. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Together with his wife, they settled in the wilds of Wapaka County on what is now Marl Lake. Immediately, they started to build a haven in the wilderness. It's difficult to find words that will adequately describe its beauty. Chris Hildegard loved people and he loved the outdoors. The slogan, where nature lovers meet, is symbolic of Whispering Pines. He wanted people to enjoy it with him. The beauties of nature, the beauty of peaceful surroundings of hundreds of tall pine trees. Over the years, beautiful beds of gorgeous flowers are added and a collection of antiques. Wild animals and birds seem to sound the friendliness of Chris Hilliard found sanctuary in the solitude of Whispering Pines. For 37 years, untold thousands of visitors have enjoyed the hospitality that's always prevailed at Whispering Pines. Grandparents enjoy taking their grandchildren to visit the beauties that they themselves enjoyed as children. It's the outstanding attraction on the Chain Lakes for young and old alike. During the intervening years, Chris Hildegard became a legend in the area. He exemplified the true spirit of America. He had a sincere appreciation of what nature provided for him, and he wanted others to enjoy it. Yes, Chris Hildegard has gone to his reward, but the winds will continue to blow through the stately pines and the memories of what he has contributed towards the pleasure and the enjoyment for others will always remain as a monument to his memory. So then on January 9th, 75, after Emma died, this is the, the eulogy that was spoken by Reverend Eugene Gorky, who officiated at her funeral. Um, we went to that. Chris and I were at the funeral, and it's with her grandparents. I don't think we were. Um, anyway, he wrote to the Wapak County Post again, two and a half years ago, my family and I were driving around the Chain of Lakes in a kind of getting acquainted excursion since we were new to the Wapaka area. We followed a sign that directed us to Whispering Pines Park. What an enjoyable afternoon that turned out to be. A towering grove of majestic pine trees shading an area of swings, slides, merry-go-rounds, and games. Our children were delighted as they raced from one thing to the next while some older people sat peaceably on benches or logs. Friendly squirrels played on the rustic fences while chipmunks scampered over the well-groomed grounds. <coughs> Flowers welcomed everyone with beautiful blossoms of red and orange. I couldn't believe it. There was no parking lot attendant or fee. There was no gate or admission charge. No advertisement to buy this or that. Not even a box for donations to help maintain the park. It was one of those times I wanted to buy refreshments for the children because I thought that must be how they make their money. But the prices were reasonable, barely enough for even a modest profit after expenses. The amber sunset over the bluish green waters of Marl Lake came too soon that day. We didn't have enough time to savor the relaxing atmosphere of this natural, carefree oasis. As we drove away, I said to my wife, I wonder who owns that park? I wondered why they permitted others to browse so freely. Knowing how often things get broken that children play on, I couldn't imagine why they provided so much equipment free. I really wanted to write a note of thanks and appreciation to the owners. I inquired, as I now realize it was not anywhere near enough, of a few people to find out who owned it. Even though everyone knew the name of the park, no one seemed to know the names of the public benefactors who would be thanked for its facilities. The user response to my, inquir my inquirers, inquirers, inquiries was just a retired couple from Chicago with a caretaker who's been around for a long time. Last Friday, I found out the names of people who had unknowingly touched and lifted my life because they had cared enough to share a beautiful piece of God's creation. It was too late. Emma Hildegard died, and then it was announced that she and her late husband, Chris, had maintained and opened the park to the public, their front yard, which was often mistaken for a state or county park since 1929. Mm -hmm. The Hildegards did not own thousands of acres of land, which were usually associated with, with great philanthropists, but the 30 beautiful acres they possessed they were willing to share with others. They discovered the beauty of a grove of pine trees along the lake. They had an opportunity to sell a successful milk business in Chicago. With the proceeds, they retired early so they could develop the property and share with the public. 
As good stewards, they try to make it nicer and nicer. They wanted to have a place, and place for children to play. Obviously, they loved people and had discovered that the only way to find happiness and contentment is not to hoard a treasure to oneself and share it with others. Their love of nature, beauty, and people enabled them to touch and influence the lives of many people for good. Many of their lives of care, may their lives of caring and sharing a part of God's beautiful creation be an example for all of us. I was, I was pretty touched by that. Any other thoughts? Any? You gonna spread the word now? Keep this alive? Yeah.